Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed this little sneak peek preview of our exhibition. Uh, remember, next Thursday, February 4th, from 6 p.m. onwards, we will stream our online opening of Beyond States on the tried and tested platforms Facebook, YouTube, and of course, our very own debatorial. Make sure to mark that day in your calendars. The very last of the works introduced in the video you just saw is that of Dutch artist Jonas Stahl, whom we now have the immense pleasure to welcome with us. Joining us again is my dear colleague and curator of the exhibition, Ina Nedermeyer. Welcome back. And before I hand the mic over to Jonas, a brief introduction to the artist who is about to give us a 30-minute lecture on his practice and the New World Summit. So, Jonas Stahl is a Dutch artist, Dutch visual artist, born 1981 in Zwolle. His work deals with the relation between art, propaganda and democracy. He's the founder of the artistic and political organization New World Summit, started in 2012 and is still ongoing. And he campaigned New Unions, which started in 2016 and is still ongoing as well. With Bach, the basis for Akte Le Kunst in Utrecht, he co-founded the New World Academy from 2013 to 16. With Florian Malzacher, he is currently directing the Utopian Training Camp, Training for the Future. And with Lor Provost, he is co-administrator of the Obscure Union. Jonas completed his PhD research on propaganda art at the PhD Arts Program of Leiden University in Netherlands published Stateless Democracy with co-editors Dila Dirick and René Indemar at Bach in 2015. He published Steve Bannon, a propaganda retrospective with, with um, Het Neuve Institute in 2018, and most recently, the Propaganda Art in the 21st Century with the MIT Press in 2019. Jonas is also a regular contributor to EFLUX, and he has realized numerous exhibition projects worldwide. These projects have been exhibited as venues such as the Victoria, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, the Museum van Hedendage Kunst, Antwerp, and the Moderna Museet in Stockholm, as well as the Biennales of Berlin in 2012, Kochi in 2013, Sao Paulo 2014, Gothenburg in 2017, and most recently Taipei in 2020. It is our utter pleasure to have you with us, Jonas. Welcome again to the Assembly Beyond Borders. And now the digital stage is yours. Thank you, Dominique, for the introduction and for organizing the conference, Ina as well, and everyone, uh, everyone else in the, in the back end uh, organizing in this, uh, assemblies in this uh, complex uh, period of time. I'm going to share my screen with you so that I can show you some images during my presentation. There we go. So my talk uh, is entitled Art and um, Stateless Democracy. It, it will relate specifically to some of the uh, projects that are on view as part of the Beyond States exhibition at the, at the Zeppelin Museum right now. Maybe to give you just a, a little bit of context, Dominico already introduced me as, as an artist, as a propaganda researcher. I will focus today specifically on examples from my practice that relate to what I call organizational art. So the development of art that take the form of organizations, or you could say organizational art is a way of looking at organizations as art forms. So uh, an example uh, has been the long running New Unions campaign that I founded in 2016. So it's an artwork that takes the form of a campaign, uh, a campaign to create uh, assemblies, to create spaces of gathering, as you can see here, uh, to reimagine alternative futures for the European um, Union. Well, let's say for the transnational project of unionization, the most interesting part uh, of the European Union from uh, my perspective and, my, uh, and of my collaborators has been the notion of union, less, uh, less that of, of Europe, the need to think transnationally or planetary uh, rather than thinking on uh, in terms of, of, of specific uh, national geographies or na national boundaries. And in the process, the New Unions campaign collaborated with different uh, transnational pan-European political organizations like DiEM25 that you can see here in an, in an uh, assembly in uh, Athens. Um, and we've, we've tried, me and my collaborators in the, in the campaign, to try to re-articulate uh, and propose speculative symbols, speculative spaces, alternative European parliaments, um, from the conviction that the role of, of art, the role of, of artistic imaginary 
uh, can push us beyond certain boundaries and dichotomies um, that dominate our present. And of course, in, the, in, the, in relationship to the European Union and its manifold crisis, that dichotomy has been very much represented by the Brexit um, reduction uh, uh, in, into leave and remain campaigns, as if there were no third or fourth or fifth or sixth uh, future scenarios for alternative unions, feminist unions, communalist unions, transcontinental unions. Um, so the role of organizational art, in, in my perspective, in my practice, is also to uh, push the, the boundaries of the imaginary, the boundaries of the imaginary in which we can um, uh, uh, realize new forms of political action, new forms of political organization. Another example has been a project called Interplanetary Species Society that responds directly to the fact that in the in the next uh, 10 to 20 years or so, humans will become an interplanetary species through uh, libertarian endeavors, extractivist endeavors like Elon Musk's SpaceX and his project for Mars colonization. And the Interplanetary Species Society takes the form as an artwork that takes the form of an alternative experimental biosphere, as you can see here in an underground former nuclear uh, research center in, uh, in Stockholm. Um, but our biosphere, rather than thinking about what it means to become an extraplanetary, interplanetary uh, species, thinks of what it means to become an intra intraplanetary species. What does it mean to re-establish bonds on and uh, within the Earth? Um, what does it mean today to become an interplanetary species when we are simply exporting the worst of our colonial and imperialist histories that is that's, that, that is instantly visible in the language of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and this type of um, uh, libertarian uh, um, uh, leaders of, of extractivist uh, corporations that speak shamelessly of Mars colonization, of humans becoming a new generation of pioneers. And in our experimental biospheres, we're rather looking at what does it mean to re-establish deep bonds on Earth, not only in our present, but even across deep time, for example, by creating assemblies with uh, ammonite fossils that you can see here, the family of octopus and squid that died in the fifth mass extinction. They are literally the fossils in fossil fuels that we're burning, burning up now to accelerate the present and make a possible survivable future um, impossible. To, we're, we're undoing the future through the burning of this of these earth uh, memories. And the, the, the ammonites were also the witnesses of the fifth mass extinction, just as we are witnesses to the sixth mass extinction. They are fossils, we are fossils in the making. So in the, in the Interplanetary Species Society, we're, we're looking at re-engaging new bonds, new forms of assembly across uh, human and non-human uh, comrades, you could say, um, but also across different scales of time, from uh, deep past to deep futures, to the to, from deep past to deep presence to the possibility of deep futures. A last example uh, from organizational art, uh, from my organizational art practice, is a recent uh, lawsuit that I uh, initiated together with human rights lawyer Jan Vermont, titled "Collectivize Facebook." Uh, which I think is relevant in the period of this uh, pandemic in which our dependency on so-called trillion dollar companies such as Amazon and Facebook has only, uh, has only become uh, uh, more intensified. Um, their quarter numbers in the period of the pandemic are the best of a lifetime. And that essentially shows that our crisis, our demise, our precarization is their capital, is their income uh, revenue <clears throat> and their disproportional, the disproportional impact of these uh, companies on the public good, on the public domain, uh, brought lawyer Jan Vermont and me to argue, to seek for a legal argument in which uh, not only these companies should be recognized as forms of public domain, but that their ownership should be transferred to their users, meaning that our lawsuit against uh, Facebook that we will be filing at the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council in, uh, in Geneva and does not only want to recognize, have Facebook recognized as a public domain, but transfer its ownership to its users. So it's two and a half billion users should become its, um, its governors, so to say. Um, so that means that, that we're not looking for the reform of trillion dollar companies. We're not looking to nationalize trillion dollar companies. We're looking at ways of thinking through this current crisis, this, this current crisis of our commons to um, imagine and enact new forms of transnational cooperatization. 
now I think through these uh, examples, I'm already touching on several of the uh, key themes in, in beyond states, uh, the, the practice of state building, reimagining state building, reimagining forms of governance that go beyond uh, the traditional model of the nation state. And these questions are also central to the uh, main um, example for my practice that I wanted to share with you today, uh, the New World Summit, an organizational artwork uh, in the form of a series of alternative parliaments. So the New World Summit uh, was founded in 2012. Um, it has many members uh, um, uh, from the field of arts, design, architecture, diplomacy, and uh, progressive law. And we create since 2012 alternative parliaments for stateless and blacklisted organizations. So when I say speak of these parliaments, I mean these kind of architectural assembly type constructions, as you can see here uh, in drawing and here realized uh, for the first time in the, um, the Sophienzele in Berlin as part of the seventh Berlin um, biennial. And the flags that you see surrounding the parliament organized by color all belong to organizations which in the context of the war on terror, the ongoing war on terror, have been placed on so-called designated lists of terrorist organizations. And once being, being placed on such a list essentially means uh, that one, one's bank account is frozen, a travel ban is imposed, um, the uh, passports are revoked. One is essentially declared stateless, which is a, a very cynical dimension of the, the process of blacklisting if you consider the fact that many organizations on blacklists are already stateless peoples, peoples that have uh, waged decades, if not longer, struggle for their right to self-determination, their right to be recognized as a nation. So here at the first New World Summit from left, left to right, you see representatives of the Basque independent movement, the Kurdish women's movement, the Filipino uh, underground resistance, the Kelt Tamashek uh, independence movement. They're active in the northern part of uh, Mali in the region of the Sahara and the, and the Sahel. And important to, to note is that rather that than these organizations being a fundamental threat to democracy out of some kind of uh, deeply embedded hatred for democracy, which is, of course, the kind of underlying propaganda narrative of the war on terror, the so-called us versus them dichotomy, and the, the uh, supposed so-called terrorists attack and uh, the free, enlightened, democratic West out of a, out of a hatred for um, for its its for its freedoms. The reality is. Uh, with many of the organizations that we gathered in these uh, summits, that they, are that they are groups who stem from long-standing uh, anti-colonial liberational movements who most certainly have a theory and practice of democracy that they bring forward, but a, a form of deep democracy uh, that demands fundamental redistribution of wealth, colonial reparations, too democratic for capitalist democracy to bear. So rather than being opposed to democracy, um, I think the New World Summit tried to contribute to create a space where we can see that our time is shaped by very conflicting understandings of what democracy is or should be. Uh, and that there's a fundamental difference between uh, democratic socialism, for example, on one hand, and capitalist democracy uh, on the other. So the New World Summit as a project continued over several years. Here you see the fourth New World Summit in, in uh, Brussels, the alternative parliament of the fourth New World Summit in, in Brussels. Um, where we try to continue to, to uh, unfold and recompose, you could say, this uh, us versus them dichotomy that, that underlies the, the war on terror. What exactly constitutes us in this, um, in this master narrative? Is it possible that um, between us as citizens of civil society that oppose the war on terror and the groups that are being prosecuted in the war on terror, is there possibly more common ground, more commonality between us than with the criminal states uh, that, that, that claim to speak and act in our name uh, in uh, mass invasions in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in Libya. Um, could the space of art and could the alternative parliament be a space where we start to recompose this us in the us versus them dichotomy, recompose common interests and new uh, unities and, and common horizons? And in the process, uh, can we explore uh, the role of art in visualizing our world not under uh, that is in, in, in that is narrated uh, from a position of uh, of victors, uh, but that has many uh, many struggles, many more worlds that are 
attempting to come into being uh, as we speak. And that's something that you can see here in the, the maps that we developed with the various uh, participants, different representatives of uh, stateless um, nations, stateless peoples that assembled in the New World Summit in Brussels, uh, where we developed with each of these organizations maps that represent their struggle to write, uh, their, their struggle for their right to self-determination, but also the, let's call it the state imagination that they're trying to bring forward. And then we see in some cases, maybe more traditional understandings of the state with clearly defined uh, territories. But in some cases, as with the third map um, down called democratic confederalism, uh, we also see visual models appear that go beyond purely territorial uh, boundaries and, and claims. However important these of course are, claim to the, the right to self-determination over one's territory, one's common resources but it start to spark possible other forms of uh, societal uh, societal organization. So here you see one of the maps behind one of the speakers, the summits being a space where we're trying to unfold, not the world according to the victors, but you could say the, the world according to uh, the resistance, the world according uh, to those still trying to create uh, other new worlds in the in the process. An important uh, part of our research and work has, has been on the question, what constitutes a parliament? Um, for us, the parliament is an inherently artistic cultural space. It's an architectural space. Uh, it's a theatrical space. It's a performative space. It's a space that is driven and guided by certain uh, political and visual uh, symbols that form common horizons, common, common understandings. Uh, and as such, the parliament is is a is a form that really shows a particularly particular agency of art, a particular power of art, uh, not the executive power that we associate with policy with with uh, politics, not the the power of governance, but the power to give form to power. And what is a what is a politician? What is a parliament? What is a senate? Uh, without the visual forms that give legitimacy. To this, to this power. If you strip that away, what do you have? It shows a strange relative power of art to give form to power. And in our parliaments, as you might have noticed also from the previous slides, we, we have tried to challenge the often very hierarchical understanding, centralized understanding of parliaments. Generally, parliaments tend to take the form of, um, of a half or two thirds of a circle uh, centered on, uh, on a central speaker, on a central uh, representative. In our cases, we our speakers and public often occupy the same space. Uh, a speaker might stand up from across the room, speak towards you or suddenly stand up next to you and, and seemingly speak on behalf of you. Uh, and that way our parliaments also try to show how performative and spatial dynamics impact the way that we feel represented or that we disengage from representation. When someone speaks close to you and there's a physical nearness, even if you might not agree with what the person is saying, the performative experience is this person is speaking on behalf of me. It's like an extended body of me. Whereas a person standing up on the other side of the room immediately in evokes a kind of oppositional um, dynamic, trying to reach you, trying to, trying to cross over the space that um, divides you. So our parliaments are, are, are made in a way that try to make visible also how uh, morphology, the genealogy of form, how artistic form, uh, shapes our understanding of representation, shapes our um, uh, affective and uh, affective capability, our capability to identify uh, with one message and not uh, with another. And this visual, or let's say this morphological research uh, addresses many, many aspects. Um, from very early onwards, we stopped working with chairs, for example, um, because we felt that chairs tend to strongly individuate and the presence of uh, of bodies in a in a space a chair is a bit of a of a tragic form um it can only do two things it can be full or empty and when you enter a space um uh, with uh, with 100 chairs and 80 people somehow your eyes are immediately drawn to those who are absent instead of to those who are present as if those who have not come uh, claim more space and energy and attention than those who are actually there so we tend to work with benches and benches have a very interesting history in uh, various utopian architectures. And the interesting thing about the bench is that 
uh, one person on the bench is a full bench. Ten people on the bench are a full bench. Uh, benches are structures that are um, negotiated from the moment that people enter into a space. There's always more space on the bench if someone is willing to give that space to another. So it, it extends uh, questions of um, democracy and democratic negotiation to the spatial structure itself. We are not simply public. Uh, we become, through the spatial construction, we, we become come to co-constitute the uh, parliament of bodies, you could say, uh, that explores um, a, a sense of commonality, sense of common agency. Um, and maybe that's a, a last note that I want to make on this on this visual exploration it has to do with the, the, the geometrical shapes of the parliaments. Uh, sometimes parliaments like the one you see here, the circular parliament, uh, it's the quickest form to emphasize a sense of unity. Uh, even between people who might have never met each other before. The, the Purely the spatial construction of it uh, creates a, a sense of commonality. And at the same time, um, while the circle has this, this capability of creating an instant set of inclusion, uh, those who enter the circle later on, uh, when the circle is already filled, when the circular structure is full, uh, feel a maximum experience of exclusion. The circle suddenly doesn't become inclusive, it becomes a new kind of wall. So that sometimes more fragmented forms, like the parliament that I showed you before, that was was constructed based on these kind of overlapping triangles, uh, spaces that have slightly more uh, fragmented and open-ended uh, points of access, can morphologically um, uh, create more points of of entry and 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 access. So these have all been visual and spatial and performative um, questions that have been as important for us as the. Uh, political questions that we're trying to address, our uh, resistance, our opposition against the politics of blacklisting, the propaganda narratives of the war on terror, the us versus them dichotomy. All of these political questions have a, a spatial, visual, morphological, performative um, uh, translation in the, the alternative parliaments. Now I want to uh, close with um, ex the example of the... Um, I want to close by introducing the last, the most recent chapter of the New World Summit, um, which has been less about creating a space to host various um, political, stateless, blacklisted organizations, but uh, constitutes consists of a direct collaboration with uh, with one of them, um, and that is the democratic self-administration of Rojava. Rojava uh, means West, refers to the western part of Kurdistan, and that is the northern part of present-day uh, Syria. And in 2012, when Assad's, uh, the Assad regime's forces were drawn, drawn to the south to fight the Islamic State, the original inhabitants, original Kurdish inhabitants in the north, together with their uh, Assyrian and Arab allies, uh, declared this region autonomous. So it's, we're talking about the autonomous government of Rojava, autonomous region in the northern part of Syria, western part of Kurdistan. And maybe you are familiar with images such as these images of the women's protection units, the self-organized women's militia <clears throat> that have defended Rojava from uh, continuous attacks of the Islamic State, from the Assad regime, uh, from the current uh, incursions in the territory by the Erdogan uh, regime, the Turkish regime. Um, but images less familiar might be, um, might be photos such as these, uh, the People's Parliament of Hamishlo, a city in the uh, region of the autonomous government, where an old theater of the Assad regime has been transformed into a people's uh, parliament. And why a people's parliament? Because the main political model that is followed uh, by the Rojava revolutionaries is referred to, or is explained by them as a form of stateless democracy, uh, a desire to create a democracy without the state. And this, of course, has a lot to do with the imperialist history of the state in uh, the larger region of the of the Middle East, um, it has uh, that that led to the, to the conviction that fundamentally the structure of the state, its patriarchal, nationalist, capitalist um, allegiances, stands in fundamental opposition uh, to the practice of democracy, the practice of day-to-day -day collective self-governance. Uh, uh, so that even though paradoxically, at least in the history of um, of the, of the Athenian city-states, uh, democracy uh, emerged from the structure of the, of the state, 
uh, only in its separation, democracy can come to its full emancipatory potential. This is the analysis of the Rojava revolutionaries. And as a, as a result, um, stateless democracy in practice means that the smaller the political entity, let's say the commune or the municipality, the more executive power they have, the more decision-making power they have, the larger the structure, the less. So it would be as if um, your municipality has more power uh, than your national government. Both structures exist, but the, 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 the agency, um, uh, the investment of power fundamentally shifts. Now, the Kurdish revolutionary movement, Kurdish women's movement, um, as you might have noticed from the earlier slides, they were part of the New World Summit from the very beginning. And the ideas of stateless democracy uh, were, have, were extremely um, inspirational for us as well. Uh, the New World Summit is a series of stateless parliaments for um, stateless peoples. Our parliaments do not aim to represent uh, nation, existing nation states. In that sense, they, they were trying from the beginning to decouple the, the practice of another form of alternative form of democra democracy uh, from the structure of the, of the nation states. And as a result, uh, me and my team were invited to travel to Rojava in, the, uh, in 2014 to uh, witness and document the process of this project of stateless democracy coming into being. And we were guided by Amina Osso, that you see here, who was uh, at the time the Minister of Foreign Affairs in uh, Jazeera, which is one of the cantons of the uh, autonomous government uh, of, uh, of Rojava. And she was um, well aware of the work we had been doing with the New World Summit and invited us uh, to think, to collaborate with her to create a new um, public parliament. A parliament is a public space. It would be the first uh, parliament we would create that would have a permanent uh, realization, that it would not be a temporary parliament. Um, but as she assured us, uh, as Rojava is a stateless democracy, it would essentially remain a stateless parliament, but it would no longer approach statelessness uh, from a position as something that is can be equated with powerlessness. Um, Amina emphasized uh, statelessness in stateless democracy is a precondition to liberate democracy from the state. It's not merely um, a, a word with which we describe what it means to lose the protection of the state. Uh, it's a word that describes the necessity to liberate ourselves from uh, statist mentality and uh, st existing statist forms. So here you see the digital uh, model that we developed with her, with the autonomous, uh, with the autonomous government of what this parliament as a public space could be. And for her, for Amina, the idea of the parliament as a public space was was essential, um, not to separate the space of representation uh, from the space of the public domain, but for these to be one and and the same. The process of construction was complex uh, because of course uh, it, it we started in 2015 it opened in 2018 but this was also the period in which the syrian civil war was uh, continuing and a lot of resources were necessary to defend the autonomous region against attacks of the uh, islamic state uh, it was a collaboration very close collaboration with the um, autonomous government and uh, me and my team were responsible took responsibility for half of the uh, costs of of producing the of, of producing the the parliament, so we saw it as much as a as a collaboration as as possible uh, for the parliament also to become uh, over time a, a meeting space, not only a space of representation uh, within the Rojava autonomous government, but potentially also a meeting space, a point of exchange um, between uh, other uh, progressive emancipatory political movements and platforms and activists. Um, that stand in solidarity with the Rojava um, political project. As you can see, um, the parliament takes a circular form, but it's important that to, to note that it's not the kind of full circle that we try to take the lessons from uh, the, the circle being the most inclusive and most exclusive form at the same time. So instead it has a slightly more, it's a slightly more deconstructed dome with various uh, shells overlapping one another, um, uh, creating a kind of circular space that 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 has a, a, a an element of unification and at the same time feels as if it's always permanently under construction, which of course relates to the um, uh, is a kind of visual translation of the political dynamics of stateless democracy. That the project of day-to-day -day, uh, self-governance is a continuous practice uh, and not an, an uh, not a, uh, a pre-described. Uh, model to uh, to follow. 
Here you see images of the opening uh, in 2018. And maybe to go inside the parliament, um, you see the, 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 the visual dynamics uh, once it is uh, occupied and, and used um, by the various uh, local communes. The parliament really becomes this, uh, this parliament of bodies, the kind of the architecture, the concrete base disappears and the space between uh, what you would consider the public and the speakers in the center uh, is as small as possible. The space between uh, uh, public and representative minimized as much as, as we could to create or emphasize this aspect of collective self-representation, which is, of course, at the foundation of uh, the project of stateless democracy. The surrounding pillars, the metal pillars, uh, on them there are various uh, words and terms that are written in uh, the various languages of the region, almost like a spatial manifesto of the alternative social contract of stateless democracy, words like self-governance, words like gender equality, social ecology, and that are crucial in the political project. And the rooftop that you see here uh, behind the dancers during the um, inauguration, it consists of fragments of flags that belong to the different uh, organizations of the region that drive, that lead the project of stateless democracy, the project of day-to-day self-governance. And it uh, has various references, the flags have various references to uh, suns and stars that have both uh, a genealogy in uh, in, in Kurdish culture um, and in culture of uh, political internationalism. Again, trying to become this uh, meeting point uh, between different solidarities across uh, different boundaries, uh, a, a stateless parliament for a stateless democracy. And I feel that that this, um, this project, this last example from our work with the New World Summit is particularly important because uh, particularly relevant for our ideal of what art is or could be as a space that uh, that has a symbolic function. The, the parliament is a spatial manifesto, a, a, a visual construction that uh, translates, you could say, emancipatory ideology into a new morphology, into visual forms. Um, it has in that sense a representational, maybe even monumental um, uh, component to it. Um, but it's not separated from what it's trying to represent. It is simultaneously the parliaments where the ideas that are ingrained in its architecture, in its sculptural form, are put to practice. Um, art and politics are not necessarily, I don't believe, are not necessarily the same thing. The competence of an organizer is not the same as the competence the, of visual literacy that is contributed by an artist. But the two shape each other continuously. They, they can't be separated from each other either. Um, and to, to create a new art, uh, we... Uh, inherently needs a new politics. Uh, so throughout my work, throughout the examples of my organizational art practice that I try to share with you, this has been a kind of guiding principle. Art and politics are not necessarily the same, but in the best cases, they contribute to each other's um, emergence and to create a new culture, to change our ideas of what art is or could be as a world-making um, practice. Uh, it means that we also need to seek for alliances and exchanges uh, between emancipatory politics on one hand uh, and emancipatory art uh, on the other. With that, I see that I arrived at my uh, 30 minutes. So I, I thank you very much for taking the time to uh, listen to me. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, Jonas, for this insightful presentation. And um, that art and politics distinction is something we're uh, definitely going to come back to. Um, for our very last section of the day now, um, we're opening up the panel again and are very, very happy to welcome Bianca Balint of the Club of International Politics, a student-led initiative that is associated at the local Zeppelin University. Let me introduce Bianca briefly. Bianca Balint completed her cultural political voluntary service at the Goethe, Goethe Institute in Jakarta and an internship at the German-Iranian Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Tehran. In 2018, she received the scholarship of the Stiftung der Deutschen Wirtschaft, which is the German Economy Foundation, and she completed internships at the German Handelsblatt in 2019 and most recently at the Society for International Cooperation, which is in Germany the GIZ, the Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit. She's currently 
finishing her study of SEP, uh, SPE, I'm sorry, Sociology, um, Politics and Economics at Zeppelin University and works as a project assistant at Goethe Institute, has been the deputy chairwoman of the Club of International Politics for the last two years. So welcome Bianca and again, welcome the two of you. Thanks it's a pleasure to have you with us. And I would like to start with a question directed to Bianca. Um, you have witnessed the talk and the presentation that Jonas just gave to us and the community. Um, what do you think could be adapted by his thoughts, his projects on other states or maybe governmental organizations? Or maybe should be adapted? Yeah, so thank you very much, first of all, Dominic, for the kind introduction. And um, yeah, thank you for having me also as a representative of the Club of International Politics. Um, I think this is a great format and I look very much forward to the discussion. Um, so yeah, the question you raised um, concerning what can, what can be implemented also on a global level um, for me also this concept actually for stateless democracy is something that I heard for the first time when I um, when I looked into into the art of Jonas Stahl. Um, well and for me also a central question um, is whether um, stateless organizations they forced to to be a stateless organization since they are um, denied also from from other states in in their existence. Um, so maybe first of all, before before coming to that question, I would like to ask Jonas: Like, do you differentiate between um, um, your art where where stateless organizations choose to um, choose to be stateless, or where they are forced to be stateless? Yes, of course. Uh, I think the in the case of the the. Uh, the, the autonomous government of, of Rojava, the Kurdish revolutionary movement, is, is in a way exceptional because they have in the history of their struggle um, originally for an independent Kurdish nation state that they came to a kind of internal critique starting to question, yes, but actually what does it mean to reproduce the political order uh, that oppressed us in the first time, in the first uh, case. Um, and, and from there came this analysis of how does the state structure um, both micro and macro politics. So uh, Abdullah Öcalan, the Kurdish revolutionary leader and thinker um, that developed this concept of stateless democracy, uh, he speaks, for example, of the family uh, as a man's small state. So he sees a kind of the, the patriarchal ownership in the, uh, of the family or the patriarchal construction of the family as something that then reflects in a, in a macro political uh, realm where he speaks of the state as a colony of capital, for example. So the state is a, a not so much as something that represents independence or sovereignty, um, but that's something that reprodu reproduces a kind of imperialist uh, dependency. But of course, in the context of the New World Summit, we work with many different uh, stateless and blacklisted organizations, and it's not uh, we don't prescribe, uh, or <laughs> that's not our role and not our desire. Uh, what, uh, how the, the, the term of statelessness is, is defined. This is, of course, up to each of these organizations. And the fact that stateless democracy has such an inspiring kind of emancipatory potential that, that, that has attracted many, many peoples and activists across uh, the world, not just people who belong to the Kurdish community, doesn't mean that statelessness does not simultaneously represent an extremely, um, it represents extremely precarized and uh, violated lives uh, not to be recognized or administered by the, by by a state uh, even even though being a recognized citizen doesn't mean necessarily that you're protected by the state but in many cases it, it represents relative privileges um, and the struggle of the Rojava autonomous government as a non-state entity is also not to be underestimated not just because of the attacks of the Islamic State and the Erdogan regime but also the fact that they in the current language of interstate politics, they cannot be recognized and they cannot be seen because states only understand states. Um, so, of course, it also has a lot of uh, consequences on, on the level of diplomatic and political representation and e economic uh, and economic uh, participation. 
Right, yeah, then perhaps also, yeah, coming back to your question, Dominic, that you raised. Um, so thank you also, Jonas, for, for the discussion. Um, so I actually like, and I acknowledge your, your work very much that you do, and also giving um, giving space and giving a voice to um, to political organizations that have unrightfully been backlisted. But I would still argue that for actually like until now, there is no equivalent substitute to the nation state. So um, when, when of course stateless organizations are, are forced to be um, stateless, then I think it's, it's a great model also for the future. And um, I, I would definitely support this concept, but um, in the first case, so when, when stateless organizations actively choose not, not to be a state, I think then we have, well, some, I would say conflicting interests since in, in my opinion, like democracy needs stable institutions. And in the end, like there's on the long term, I would argue that there's no way around on building um, a stable nation state since there is a need for, for a constitution and political bodies to execute politics. Um, and we're also, also, of course, trust plays an essential issue. So you have to trust in the institutions that they are long lasting and they will enforce your civil rights. And I believe that this competence until now only um, only holds in, in a nation state, which is yeah built on a long lasting basis. That is a very interesting position, I would say. Um, but I think, Ina, maybe you can, you can go ahead with the, with the next question, please. Oh, no, or maybe Jonas wants to, to respond. <laughs> so yeah, I think I, this might be interesting to know if the nation state is obsolete or if it's still something that will be relevant in the future. I mean, it, it, it of course depends because the, in the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic, we have also seen um, the necessary, uh, the, the, the possible necessary powers of the state when it comes to defending um, public health. Although in most cases, of course, this has not exactly been the case. Um, uh, many states have uh, bought out in the billions uh, trillion dollar companies that are precarizing our lives in the first place. And in that sense, Ercalan's analysis of the state having become a colony of capital, a colony of uh, transnational capital, seems pretty accurate. It is very rare. Um, it, it's very rare examples like the Spanish government that at least temporarily nationalized private healthcare infrastructures, for example, that have shown that, of course, the structure of the state and its uh, uh, can, uh, depending on context, um, uh, defend a, a, a greater public good. But in most cases, I, I would not necessarily argue that this that this has been the, has been the case. If you put me in front of the choice between um, un, uh, uh, between living under the governance of transnational corporations without any form of democratic control, or to have still some kind of electoral checks and balances, of course the choice is very simple. Um, but can the nation state, as we know it, as a kind of uh, overlapping understanding of territory? a nation and a structure of, uh, of governance, um, can these truly address the planetary crisis that we are now facing, the intersection of, the, of political, economic, um, uh, humanitarian, ecological uh, crisis? Um, this, the, the vaccine nationalism that we see, for example, now, is that not very strongly enabled by statist uh, mentality? And can we acknowledge on one hand, as I think Bianca says very rightly, that the state has an emancipatory heritage. It, it articulated common bonds over a larger group of peoples than existed previously. And, and in that sense, it has an emancipatory trajectory that should not be rejected. But how do we rethink that as a, into a planetary uh, paradigm that is actually capable of um, redistributing wealth at new scales, and capable at, um, at, at uh, uh, enforcing colonial um, reparations uh, and creating the conditions in which each of us on this world have a equal capability to struggle for some kind of meaningful form of uh, survival in the uh, climate catastrophe to, to come. So I think that the, the, the work in this case specifically of the Kurdish uh, revolutionary movement, it opens pathways 
to start thinking of forms of uh, of collective self-governance that certainly have social contracts that don't deny the need of uh, equivalent forms of uh, co of constitutions um but that do redistribute our agency to defend uh, common interests that if i look at it factually have not exactly been um let's say well protected by the interstate community as we know it now um yes and maybe uh, a follow-up question might be um it, it is interesting to see the relationship of state and nation in the Rojava project, because maybe I'm wrong, but I have the impression that the nation concept is more important than the state in this concept. And if I'm right, maybe you could say, how does it come that the nation that might be, in my view, a little bit um, old fashioned or it's more like of the white wing people, um, how does it come Does it um, that it's so important or more important than the state in the Rojava project? I think it's a very good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I can only answer it based on my interpretation of uh, my, my own understanding as a non-Kurd uh, of, of why this notion of the nation has remained very important. Uh, and, and you're right, in, in, in Kurdish revolutionary politics it is. They separate in a way the nation from the idea of the state. But I think historically, um, the nation or the, or recognizing the fact that that there that there exist cultural bodies and cultural genealogies that connect us through through language, through storytelling, through music, um, that these are are most certainly very are, are very real. Um, but they're not necessarily the same as nationalism, where these uh, where these translate into um, extremely reductive understandings of who ha who is entitled to be a member of a community in relationship to a particular uh, territory or access to sp sp to specific uh, to specific resources, and I think a, a great challenge in rethinking the need or reimagining the need of uh, for transnational form of politics, planetary forms of politics, forms of politics that go that stretch our social contracts beyond the limitations of the nation state, is to uh, think of how. Um, how not to fall into the trap of of um, of the globalist idea that reproduces uh, homogeneous uh, culture uh, that reproduces the same form or aims to reproduce the same form of capitalist democracy across the across the globe. And the right to self determination also still means the right to self determine one's own forms of life and uh, and and, and uh, agency over one's common resources and uh, the way we represent our common culture. So. Uh, planetarism is not uh, the same as as homo homogeneity. Um, a planetary politics would have to uh, defend common interests in the face, for example, of the very unequally distributed uh, climate catastrophe, um, but defend simultaneously the right to difference, to to cultural difference, cultural tradition, um, and uh, and and heritage. And maybe I can also, that is probably an additional question to um, the Rojava project in particular. Um, how, what happened on a, like on a political level after the, um, the summit in 2015, then the installation of the, of the, I still call it the parliament, the people's parliament in 2018, and has this stateless democracy achieved some sort of international um, acceptance? I mean, how how kind of did it did it approach the political, the international political processes? Um, you mean the Rojavan political project as a as a whole? Um, I mean, extremely difficult because in 2018 the Erdogan regime uh, intervened into the territory, not because the Rojavans posed any form or threat, um, but because the the Turkish uh, government has waged a decades long war against its own Kurdish population and they were extremely afraid uh, of the success of this alternative model of self governance at their at their borders. Uh, but it, it I think it was it's it's an important uh, to recognize that um, that, that the, the Turkish state invading and continuing continuing to wage war today in the Rojava political context that they responded not to any military threat. They responded to a threat of ideas. So the idea of the possibility 
of living otherwise, of living together otherwise, of governing oneself otherwise. This was the true, true threat. The, the political imagination was the threat, not the reality of uh, military intervention or, or something along these lines. Um, but of course, this has uh, this has uh, affected the political projects enormously. Um, uh, water access that has been cut from the Turkish side. Uh, there, there's a war also on an environmental level uh, waged on the territory. Nonetheless, um, the autonomous government has continued to create new cultural institutions to extend its project of democratic autonomy. Um, to uh, develop new forms of universities, new art schools that are that have been announced to uh, to open next year. Um, so th th this political project has has continued, but not certainly not um, thanks to uh, international, um, let's say, certainly not thanks to the to to interstate recognition of, of support. Uh, on the contrary, and of course, Trump's decision to remove um, U.S. military from the, the region, very small group, but that was the only kind of shield from, uh, in, in, from the, that, that protected the region from the invasion of uh, the Turkish regime. This was, uh, this was of course, terrifying after, uh, devastating after 20,000 um, partisan um, uh, uh, fighters of, uh, of the Rojava self-organized army uh, were killed fighting the Islamic State, a terrorist organization that, that is very much the product of um, of American imperialism um, to then pull out and 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 leave Rojava to fend for itself after it rid the world of something that they never uh, of of, a, of an organization that that they didn't uh, bring into being themselves. This, of course, has been uh, has, has had a huge impact and, and and came at a huge loss of life. So it shows also maybe in short it shows also the um, um, alter political alternatives are possible, but the the fear of our ruling institution, the fear of the ruling system for an alternative that doesn't represent their immediate elite interests comes at a huge um, cost uh, in the sense of comes at huge opposition. Like alternatives are possible, but, but the struggle to realize them comes with, with enormous opposition. They're not possible, they are made impossible. Yeah, and uh, Jonas, you were talking about um, the blacklisted organizations and that they became stateless or they already were stateless. And um, I would like, maybe it's a question for you both um, about the topic of statelessness, because this is also a huge topic in our exhibition. Um, I think we are all used to have a citizenship or more than one citizenship. But of course, there are a lot of people who don't have a citizenship and who are stateless. And um, so it's not only about having a passport, being able to travel, but it's also like access to um, education and so on. So maybe you could um, talk about a little bit about the negative consequences of being stateless um, as well. Who wants to start? <laughs> um, yeah, perhaps so uh, I could start. I mean, it's, it's what you've mentioned, right? So the question is always then um, that how, how, can we, how can we make sure that people, like, for, first of all, of course, why are they actually stateless? So how, um, because there, I mean, there are many ways that this could happen. Um, but then also, like, what is the best uh, for the people? So what, how, can we, how can we make sure that people who have um, become stateless also receive um, equal education and, and have yeah, can can um, can hold their their basic civil rights, and and in this form, I think it's it's a very a very good form. Like um, Jonas, with your art, that you also point out that stateless people are not um, not necessarily terrorists, as as they um, as many people would think when when they think of blacklisted um, people, but that also have for example, democratic aspirations, um, but they they choose to to um, express it in a different form. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree, of course, with what you are saying in relationship to um, to the, the 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 rights of the stateless, and and in principle, uh, I think in the UN Covenant there is a, a an, an inherent right to asylum. Um, then again, we face the the project of an increasing um, uh, increasing authoritarian world order, an increase of nationalism um, that cares very little to to nothing for these these kind of international um, obligations. And I think that with the as the scale of our crisis grow, the the the, the return, the desire to return to an understanding of the world that is uh, controlled as it's embodied by the take back control slogan of the of the brexiteers uh, this has an in, this is enormous um when people the kind of fundamental anxiety that comes with um, economic precarization that comes with understanding even if you formally deny it like the physical understanding of a changing climate the physical understanding of never seeing snow again in winter like the like what that what it does in terms of the perpetual anxiety of living in a world that is changing and you do not know how to influence you don't understand why it's changing and you don't know how to, you don't understand how you can do anything about it of course anyone who comes at these moments of vulnerability and that tells us there is a, there is something to return to and make america great again this kind of retro science fictions of returns to worlds that never existed in the first place and even if they did we should certainly not want to return to them and then project it as our common futures these stories become extremely um effective and alluring because they they promise a sense of groundness a sense of understanding and that has been that has been robbed from us um and and I think this is this is an enormous this is an enormous challenge that we face, and and I think art and culture have a a modest role to play in terms of pushing for the imagination that there are um, uh, that there that that there are real existing alternatives in the world that that that, that we live in, and that um, that to 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 break out of this to break out of our bind our our uh, the shells of our nation state, we need to. Uh, test and experiment and pre-enact and find joy in in experimenting uh, in shaping um, a, a new planetary a new planetary politics yeah thank you um i have a last question um we are showing um the work um our work by christopher Colandon thomas and annika kuhlman and in their work they are reflecting the idea of liquid citizenship uh, fluid citizenship, so it's not like the uh, traditional citizenship that is related um, to a territory, to one country, but it's yeah more it's more working in the network. And I would ask you both, like, what do you think about these ideas of uh, a possible new form of citizenship? And for you, Jonas, it might be also interesting to um, yeah to to get to know how you would. Um, combine it with stateless democracy, for instance. I don't know who wants, um, maybe Jonas, you can start. I, I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a bit familiar with the, with the project. And, and as I said before, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an important, uh, Artists in and by themselves don't don't change the world and and shouldn't have the the arrogance to think that they do, but um, as part of of larger endeavors um, of of progressive political organizations and, and and activists and educational community together with with uh, with artists, um, they have a role to play in trying to uh, project and test um, uh, uh, concepts of. Uh, non-state or post-state or transnational forms of, of organization uh, that uh, might be very hard to conceptualize through existing institutions that are entirely modeled after well, after the, the the dominant powers in our society uh, and and it, this is it's almost a way of um, it's almost a way of of of, of tricking the the status quo in, in my experience when you create like our parliaments, for example, are they are they not real? Well, they're not real in the sense that they are not uh, that they are not acknowledged by a dominant political order. So, so in that sense, they don't have the same direct agency that the national parliament might have. Have, but when we are in the parliament and we have 
speakers of these different organizations and we start to build new uh, coalitions and exchanges and explore alternative horizons of stateless or post-state uh, democracy. Can you say that that is unreal or that it is somehow fake? No, it's it's not merely in the realm of the imaginary. It's 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 too real to be imagined and too imagined to be entirely real. So you're somehow between the world that is and the world that is possible. But to create that sense of possibility, whether it's liquid liquid citizenship or the stateless parliament, to create it as a possibility, once it's in your once you experience it, it remains part of your horizon of your sense of what could be real it was too real not to be realized not to realize entirely and i think that is this kind of um, almost um uh, utopian utopian impulse of of art but and i don't mean utopia as a kind of non-space i mean utopia as a kind of um uh, activism of the imagination or imag imaginary activism of some kind to push into the world uh, forms of of being forms of life that um, that, uh, that that only become possible if we make them imaginable in the first place. Yeah, actually, I'm uh, I'm not too too familiar actually with this art project, but um, for me, like I'm I'm a very pragmatic person, so to speak. So um, when when these questions are raised, and also I mean, there's also this project with the um, dynamic borders, so that there are no fixed borders for state, but um, they depend on where their where their citizens are mostly located, and there for me like this I, this is a familiar topic. Um, many questions come up where where of course where I stop thinking about what is possible and more about okay, but how can we implement it? Um, and from my from my student perspective, there are just many questions which would still have to be answered in order to make this concept realizable. So when it comes to the dynamic borders, um, for example, a question would be then also, um, yeah, what about data security? I mean, I know this is always a very German topic, so to say. Um, but uh, yeah, in order to realize the concept, you would have to have the real-time data tracking um, and uh, yeah, that would that would have to be enabled. Um, and yeah, many legal questions also that come up with it, right? So um, when we think about liquid citizenship, when we think about um, dynamic borders, so yeah, for me, in my perspective, it's it's not that tangible um, in in a way that um, I think this concept might be really realizable in future from now. So from this. On the current situation. Judging from the panel we heard uh, earlier this morning, I think Bianca, you're referring to the concept that uh, Dr. Gatterman introduced. It's called exactly. smart, smart borders. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so this smart borders concept is like a, it's like a, a um, it's an example of an alternative border management concept that um, adapts somehow the geopolitical definition of a border independency on uh, the citizens' movements who are um, tracked via their technical devices, right? So there's um, basically several systems that surveillance um, them all the time. And so a physical border between, let's say, Germany and Switzerland would be adaptable and temporarily changed. Um, you've been talking about the institutionali um, institutionalization, excuse me, different word, uh, difficult word, um, about alternative concept of states already. And I would like to pose another question to Jonas, and maybe Bianca can answer it um, afterwards. Because Jonas, you have been, uh, you said earlier that you do not believe somehow in the distinction, in like a sharp distinction between art and politics. You rather think of your work, organizational work, as something that that makes both spheres interact with each other and maybe contribute to each other and push boundaries, right? Um, <clears throat> so. In your opinion, the boundary, the separation, the strict separation that art history somehow has built up since the 1990s, at least, the separation between politics and art, or more precisely between art and activism, because you just said imaginary activism is what you do, basically, 
Do you think this is a separation that should be declared obsolete? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't declare the <clears throat> I wouldn't declare the terms obsolete the different terms obsolete in the sense of um, that, that they might mean slightly different things. Like a person might be an artist and an activist, but but to create art or to or to engage in activism, slightly different competences, slightly different tools and um, and uh, capabilities might be might be desired. Competence might need to be developed. But for me, it's it's very evident that these two stand into a direct relationship to another, and that. Um, that in countries, for in countries where the neoliberal regime has become dominant, we see that the, our understanding of art is turned more into something of a product or like a consumer, uh, consumer service. Uh, whereas if we look at countries at this moment, like in Poland or Hungary, where uh, the Orbán regime and the Law and Justice Party are taking over power, art suddenly turns into a kind of um, nationalist fetish, something that needs to represent the the unity and the et eternity. Of, uh, of the nation as it was and as it, as it always will be. In, in other words, uh, the moment power changes, the nature of power changes, our understanding of art and culture changes. So for me, it is, uh, I, I cannot see these two separated. And I think our very conception of art, our understanding of art has been shaped by, by political changes uh, across history in the European context. Um, it, was the French, uh, it was the French Revolution in which many artists participated um, to fight also for the for their for their rights to receive public subsidies for sub, for uh, the financing of art not only being uh, invested into a minority of elite artists that were privileged by the monarchy for women to have the right to uh, enter into the art schools for the first public institutions to be created the Louvre became a public museum from a privately privately owned uh, um, uh, monarch uh, monarch's uh, uh, artworks it became a public museum as a result of the revolution. So the, the terms that we use, for example, like the autonomy of art, to, to, they are often understood as the independence of art. Art must remain away from politics to be art, because as soon as it gets involved with politics, it becomes propaganda or activism or didactic. And these are all words with which we try to, or with, with which, let's say, a dominant elite tries to kind of marginalize, like, try to maintain the separation that you're, that you're uh, talking about. But the absurdity of that, of course, is that the autonomy of art, this relative autonomy, is, is inherently tied to a history of upheaval and, and revolution. It was the, um, but it's not about autonomy as my private uh, property, my autonomy. It's about collective autonomy in which art can gain uh, an importance for more than just um, uh, the ruling elites, whether it's the monarchs or the, or the, or the nationalists. So I don't say I, I wouldn't say that art and politics are necessarily the same, but they shape each other's conditions of becoming. And as I mentioned in in the talk, uh, art doesn't have the direct executive power of a government, but it has this this power of giving form to power. Um, and that means that we each of us as artists also have a choice. What what kind of power power do we want to give form to? The the return to like this to to this perverse mythical uh, nationalisms that are that are um, and, and all of the oppressive politics that that, that that contains? Or do we really want to decorate banks and uh, create art that is mainly meant to, to speculate and trade it um, as if they are stocks and the artist is a, is a company that you can, that you can use to, to divest some of your, your, of your yearly tax duties into? I mean, I don't think that's, that's not a world, that's not a power worth contributing to. So we need to, to choose uh, what, what kind of worlds we help to bring into being. And, and with that, what kind of art worlds become possible with, uh, with a different politics. Yeah, if I may follow up on that, um, I would agree that um, art and politics have more complementary than a separating um, relationship. And I think that also art is extremely important in a way that it can draw attention to issues that politics neglects. So one example, and then I, I always think of um, are these 30,000 empty chairs which were put in front of the German parliament um, to, to draw attention to the refugee crisis in um, Moria, so on, uh, in, in Greece. And then the question for me is also referring now to the work of, um, of Jonas and, and the New World Summit. When is art only art and when it, is it already a form of politics? So that is where, where the borders become blurry. And 
yeah, I would see art like, yeah, in a role of, of, um, of activism or as in to have um, at least in some, in some regards an activistic approach, but it can show politics what goes wrong. And then the task of politics is to bring these topics on their agenda and work on new policies in cooperation with art. Um, just as, yeah, as Jonas, you have, uh, you have done it also with um, the people of Rojava. Yeah, I think, I mean, an important question, of course, is like what, which powers, and I think uh, um, uh, a difference in our in our way of approaching the conversation is what you mentioned earlier that you um, your belief in the, the the necessity for continuity of institutions. If I if I didn't um, if I didn't misunderstood, so my choice would rather than working with um, at least our current elected governments in uh, in either the Netherlands or in Greece, my choices to of the kind of politics I work with are are slightly different. Um, but I think yeah, no. In, in the in the core, we um, I think in the core we agree there. I think it's uh, we have different approaches, right? So for me, it's more an yeah. institutionalist <laughs> approach, and and yours is perhaps more one of an activistic approach. Yeah. Yeah. Although I mean, of course, my works are very much they very much take the form of institutions, like uh, whether they are biospheres or campaigns or lawsuits or alternative tribunals or parliaments. So. I'm, I'm very much of a. I very much believe in the need of institutions, and I believe in uh, in the the need of institutions as as structures that can represent common good at a certain scale, um, and and assure uh, equal access, equal distribution. In that sense, I I think we 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 probably share somehow a belief in the need of institutions. Then the question is more, how do we relate to the institutions that are? And the institutions that that maybe should be or that that, that should should become. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree, of course. Um, so if I think of it for me, it, it would be more pro, um, an approach of reforming the system from within and not destroying the old and creating a new. Um, yeah, but, but these are just just different kind of approaches, right? I mean, maybe even between those two, there are mm -hmm. a whole variety of, of other right. uh, of other approaches. Of I mean, I mean, I agree that there is an emancipatory heritage to the state, and we should not, uh, uh, starting from the at least in the European context, from the French Revolution, and these should not necessarily be and uh, this not, should not necessarily be, be cast aside. At the same time, I mean, the smart borders uh, example that was referenced earlier sounds pretty creepy. I agree with you, Bianca, that in terms of like what that means as as a something that enables mass surveillance, that 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 is really quite worrisome. Um, but but let's take that example of liquid democracy of other kind of more speculative uh, propositions. They often seem to me more realistic than believing that we can somehow continue with the institutions that we have. Um, uh, yeah, moving straight into a future that that really has no history left. I mean, we take the the Paris Climate Accord as a as an example, which is an accord that is already a, a massive consensus that puts our our world and and precarious communities in this world into life. I mean, life threatening danger. It it is even if the Paris Climate Accord is followed to the letter, it is catastrophic, a catastrophic. But somehow all of this is is clothed in a, in a language of um, consensus and being realistic. But what is realistic in burning the last fossil resources into a future without history? It, it, it seems simply criminal to me. Uh, and then the examples that are called utopian or impossible seem so much more realistic. Maybe I have another last question um, I need to ask. Um, you were talking about giving form to, to power, Jonas, and um, I'm curious um, about the future of the New World Summits. Um, are there any plans for a new summit um, you have in mind? Um, we are all facing the corona pandemic. What are the future plans? Yeah, um, I, I hope you can still hear me well because somehow all the screens in which I can see you have been uh, have been frozen. So I just presume that you are all still there. Um, and I heard your question. The future of the New World Summit at this moment, there are two two um, parliaments, these people's parliaments, as Dominique uh, uh, referenced to them, 
uh, one in Rojava, and there's a reconstruction that we made together with uh, Rojavan Diaspora in the in the Netherlands. They are both active, um, so they're active programs, active gatherings, and, and assemblies uh, with an emphasis on trying to create coalitions between uh, the Rojavans and other uh, progressive forms of uh, of, uh, of politics and and culture from across the across the world, and also to um, discuss and explore, especially in the Dutch context, what a model like status democracy that has a very specific history in a specific place with a specific people. What, what it could mean or do in a different context. Erchalan, the, the, uh, the revolutionary thinker and leader who conceptualized stateless democracy, he spoke of a kind of horizon that he called world confederalism of intersecting autonomous regions and self-governing uh, communities that would create this kind of, uh, that would over, overtake existing transnational institutions like the United Nations. So world confederalism was, this, was his uh, horizon. These are things that we discuss in the context of the parliament, also in in relationship to uh, um, political contexts outside of uh, outside of Rojava. Uh, and at this moment, the the um, the parliament in uh, Rojava itself. Now, of course, as you said, the, the coronavirus pandemic that hit that region as well has made it very difficult to create this kind of uh, biggest large scale assemblies. But the Rojava Film Commune, which is a collective of uh, filmmakers uh, in, um, in um, the Rojava Autonomous Region, will be using the parliament from March onwards, uh, also for public screenings. Um, so it's becoming in in increasingly also more of a cultural uh, space, which is a very interesting tra transition, like very similar to the uh, Hamislo parliament that I showed you earlier, the old theater of the Assad regime that is still being used as a theater and at the same time is also a parliament. And I think this is... This is also something extremely interesting that uh, this, that the space of art can become a, a kind of space, alternative space for political gathering or a political imagination, like in the form of the parliament, can then create alternative gatherings uh, in the field of, uh, of art and culture. So, um, all right, I think this is then the moment that we could close our panel talk. Thank you both very, very much. I explicitly enjoyed this little dialogue you both got into. Thank you very much um, for this highly interesting talk. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Jonas Stahl. Thank you. It was great and being with you. Thank you very much. Thank you both and take care. Bye. Mm.